morning. My name is Megan Edwards of Focus Communications, and today we're joined by Gianni Kovacevic, Lithium Bank's director and co-founder, and Martin Steffen, founding CEO of Rock Tech Lithium. Gianni and Martin, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you both? Good to be here. Yeah, very good. Thank you for uh, coming up with the idea to have this very timely, I think, discussion about uh, Lithium Canada, the German automobile manufacturers, and of course, Lithium Bank. Yes, very important. So today on the show, I would like to discuss a few lithium-based topics, obviously, from this week. First off, let's start in Canada, where the government has announced a partnership with Volkswagen and Mercedes to become a supplier for electric vehicles and batteries. Martin, starting with you, as RockTech Lithium was in the news yesterday after signing a supply deal with Mercedes-Benz, could you provide some details of this deal and perhaps your view on this larger partnership between Canada and these automotive giants? The German car industry for, for, for many years is looking more quietly for, for supply of lithium. Having learned that it's not so easy in that case to have a supply chain which is really working. Normally, the German car industry is not interested in supply. You know, they, they will buy it on the world market and they don't care where it comes from. So when they were involved into electric vehicles because they had to, because of Tesla and, and, and disrupting activities. They thought that it would be good enough just to go to battery companies and say, hey, come on, we have Mercedes-Benz or VW, give us a supply of what we like to have. Unfortunately, that didn't work out as they planned. And it took a few years. When, when I was still CEO of RockTech, it was nearly impossible to talk to these companies, let's say, four years ago, about them securing lithium. They were not interested. They, they had absolutely no idea about this. And that changed mainly in VW. They were the first one who come to the conclusion that they have, as a car company, care about supply again, which they're normally not doing. So they, they had a, the first little OMUs with other lithium suppliers, exploration companies even, to be sure that they, in the end, can get lithium on their hand, that they have to deliver it maybe to, to a battery maker which wants out of lithium. Benz was always very quiet. So the view in Germany was that they are lagging, that they are way behind. They are not getting this. But they did. They did. But they were not telling everyone. In case of BMW, I think, as far as I can tell, this company out of the big three has to learn even more about lithium market and supply and demand. Mm -hmm. And Gianni, this feels like the early days in Canada's green initiative. What are the growth possibilities for the critical metal sector in Canada? Well, I don't think we have to spend too much time and that the investors will appreciate this on what is the growth rate going to be for lithium and those key elements that are not going to get substituted out. You know, of course, our theme is lithium today, and this is something it's always going to be very important for lithium batteries, solid state batteries going forward. So is the kegger growth rate going to be 10%, 12%, 6%? There's growth. There's tremendous growth for the rest of this decade going into the 2030s. And we strongly feel that increasingly industry, global industry, is going to want to have lithium sourced from places that are going to give 20 years or 50 years of really best in class jurisdiction, governmental affairs, tax rates, and everything else that, 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 that's such a problem in extractive industries and always has been for over a hundred years. Canada is a fantastic place to do this type of business. And mm -hmm. I wanted to bring Martin along for the ride here because for people that are seeing this interview, maybe they've been following the Lithium Bank story. We IPO'd on April 1st mm -hmm. of, of this year at a time when markets unfortunately have been selling off, but we raised our capital one year before. We did it at $1.50 a share. There was tremendous investor appetite. And that was going into a company that uh, was private for almost four years. And Martin, I've known for 15 years, and he was very successful in the rock tech lithium story. Early adopter in those early lithium booms, when they restructured rock tech, Dirk and, and Martin, the stock was less than five cents a share. It went to nine dollars. So wow. it was a tremendous story. And he can maybe talk about with getting Peter Thiel involved and then talking really about building a concentrator in Germany. That's the prize. And that's where the real story is with, with RockTech. And so when we were thinking about going public with Lithium Bank, 
Martin was on the very short list to become a, like a director, an important director of Lithium Bank. And the timing wasn't quite perfect, but he is an advisor of mine. He's someone I speak German. We've been meeting each other for over 15 years. He became a shareholder of Lithium Bank. And as far as I know, he's been buying it since the IPO. He's been buying it consistently, you know, week after week in this sort of summer of the summer doldrums. And when you look at what the industry has done, where we raised our capital uh, August and September of last year, the whole industry, the lithium price has skyrocketed, the, the peer group has went up between five and 10 X. We have had none of this appreciation. So I will submit to people that once we, once we have this, uh, the news that we'll be driving forward to the fall, namely the, the long awaited preliminary economic assessment for the boardwalk property, this is something that finally with this document, it, we're able to report to that PEA, it's gonna be able to put us in the peer group. And I think this is why someone like Martin has always followed the lithium bank story and has become a significant shareholder and the story only gets fortified. I don't think anything has changed along the way here with the, the news that we just saw between Volkswagen and RockTech. You know, uh -huh. Canada's gonna be on the front line and I, it's gonna be very interesting to see how this story plays out over the coming weeks, months, and even years. Yeah, I can give some additional information because when you have a, when I was with RockTech and we had a hard rock project in Ontario and there are brine projects somewhere else, these are the only both ways which you can absolutely sure that out of this you will get a lithium carbonate and lithium chloride, which are which is the stuff you put to converters to get the battery stuff. And the what we found out very early is that the world will be running out of carbonate and sorry chloride and oxide for a sure thing in, in the next year. They have there has to be more additional sources of lithium. And it has to be these, for example, clay or oil sand or whatever, these kind of resources. There has to be a way in the end to make it happen that there's a production coming out of these sources. In this moment, as we talk, this direct lithium extraction, as, it, as it's called, called it's, 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 it's a new process. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not a stable process in a way that you have one method which works forever in every project. So you have to put it on every project and you have to find out it's a trial and error process and we are in the beginning. And for me, knowing that in the end, the market has to turn to these kind of sources, which Lithium Bank has secured when it comes to these kind of special new soils and, and layers which are involved with liquids. It's a fantastic opportunity, what I can tell because we know a lot of oxide and, and brines and we're running into huge problems with the brines in Chile right now. And there's not enough stuff there if you don't have new technology for new kind of production. Right. And so the question here is, I guess, future supply as Canada likely doesn't have enough hard rock deposits to feed future demand as a green tech supplier. Gianni, is this the opportunity for alternative lithium supplies like lithium banks Petro brine deposit to be the future supply of lithium in this country? Well, we don't know what's going to be discovered and where future discoveries will take place with lithium globally. But traditionally, lithium was extracted famously from those big solars in, in Chile, in the, in the Atacama, in Argentina. This is a, a process of evaporation, six to 12 months, and it takes a very large land footprint. And we know there's a lot of pushback in South America for expanding these types of resources. Then you have the hard rock sources where once again, it's a conventional open pit mining operation, large footprint, and it's a, a process that takes time and, and no, no different than copper or gold. You have to have all the different geological sort of uh, studies and, and layer upon layer of different level of confidence before a project goes in production. But what we're talking about is a, it's a complicated, but a much simpler process where you have this, this reservoir that's below the surface, a huge lake where water is pumped up. What is a low, low grade or low concentration of lithium is then stepped up 10 or 20 or 30 X so that you have more, more lithium in the brine. And then it goes through a second process to extract. So you end up with a, a lithium product that will go into a battery of the future. Alberta is the Saudi Arabia of this type of deposit. 
So what separates Lithium Bank from almost any other company in the world is that this is one contiguous reservoir. So it's a huge underwater lake. It's over 300 meters thick. It's in a jurisdiction that is openly, the government of Alberta supporting the, this industry is what probably the most important future pillar or leg of the Alberta economy. You have a, a extractive industries. You have tens of thousands of people working in this, in our, where, where the project is, working there already in extractive industries, mainly in the oil and gas industry. And, uh, and uh, above the surface, on the surface rights, where we have to partner or deal with one singular oil and gas contractor. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large project, it's world-class, it's big company, interesting. And the, the, these results are a relative low cost. We're able to delineate a resource and now we're working with Hatch Engineering to have what is gonna be the first economic assessment for the project. Mm -hmm. And this, this doesn't cost you know tens of millions of dollars, this costs a few million dollars. So we're, gonna, right. we're, we're there, we're going to be showing this document in the, in the coming weeks as we get into the fall. And it, for all these different reasons, it differentiates the project. But I believe that the industry, the chemical companies, the battery companies, industrialists, they're looking at this type of process because it's, it's simpler, it's got multi-decade lifespan, it's in a jurisdiction favor. And it's, it's basically, it's a, the footprint is very low because all of, all of this pumping comes up and through relatively small infrastructure, relatively speaking, you end up with a lithium product that's going to go into a battery, lithium ion battery in the future. So in other parts of the world, Saudi Arabia is also pushing strongly for clean energy and transitioning into electrification with a significant investment to not only purchase lithium supply, but to also develop their own. Martin, is this a massive step? from an oil focused nation. And it seems like we're seeing an accelerated transition to greener technology on a global scale. It, it, it looks that way. To be honest, it, it's a surprise for me that Saudi Arabia is, 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 is doing just that. You never can be absolutely sure what are the, the real motives about them doing anything, by the way. But I think what they try to do is they would like to get involved with this. But because in the end, if it works out perfectly in a perfect world, the demand for oil and gas in, in the foreseeable future, and at least in 20, 30, 40 years, will be much smaller than now. So for them, living their dream because of having oil like nobody else, I think it makes sense to be in a position to at least understand and to maybe be even part of this green revolution coming up. On the other hand, I think they would like to show the rest of the world that they are in a kind of modern Western part of maybe society coming up in a way, just the opposite of what the Eastern part of you is just seeing right now. So they want to, to, to show everyone we are modern, we're here, we are reliable, not only with oil, but maybe in the future, even with green energy. And I'll also add to that, when you, if you look at the, the headlines that you get every day now is that oil prices are, are high and rising, there's going to be shortfalls, there's an energy crisis going on. What do you think they're doing in the halls of, of, of Japanese government, of German government? And are they celebrating this high price of oil? No, they're accelerating their pivot away from the internal combustion engine. Saudi Arabia knows this. So what does the demand profile for oil look like in the year 2035, it's going to be lower. And so it's going to be an, an argument or a fight on who's going to produce those, those barrels of oil as demand eventually is going to be compressed. And you have it because of behavioral choices, you got it because of high energy prices, and, and most importantly, the, the real action that's taken place because Japan has no sources of oil. Germany has no sources of oil. And if you look graphically, a map of the world, and if, you're, if, you're, if your country relies on the export of oil on this map, the country is very large. So Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Russia, Venezuela, these countries. But which countries have no oil? They don't exist. They're the, the economic superpowers of the world, which is all the rest. And so I look at this as, okay, you know, oil is having its day in the sun. But the future is going to be in electrification and the storage of electrification, and it's going to run and be stored in lithium ion batteries. So the CAGR growth rate of that important input to make these billions and billions of batteries that are going to have to be built, the common bond is lithium. And the CAGR growth rate is going to be strong really for the next 20 years, as we've already discussed. 
and it, it they they don't have the ability to go to the conventional sources it's not going to be growth in the solars of south america we can't i can't tell you what's going to be discovered in hard rock lithium deposits there there are some exciting new discoveries but they're not going to solve the answer where you have to have these massive long long life assets like a brine where when we're able to show this and i i kind of know how the movie ends but you know the, the, the general public's gonna have to wait a few more weeks but when you look at the size and scale of what a boardwalk project can produce and deliver to the market for 50 years there's not a lot of projects like that and so we're talking right. about tweaking the chemistry at the last 50 meters we will let the big companies do that and they're all working on it right now but as far as the pumping the water up from the reservoir, lifting the lithium concentration. So we don't look at low grade lithium in a brine is a negative because you simply pump it up through a very simple process. Now you have high grade brine and you run it through there through another chemical process to end up with what will be as Martin already attested to, depending on the, the reservoir, depending on the brine, it'll be a different type of product coming out of every different type of project. But we love the porosity. We love the pH. We love the chemical properties of the of the brine coming out of the boardwalk project we love the location of, as i've already talked about and we will be working very hard through the balance of this year to deliver and communicate the results from this pa that's going to be completed by hatch engineering and i think not just the the, the investment market but really the global industry has taken a, is taking an active look at dle and we're going to be firmly on that who's who peer group list of projects that are world-class good jurisdiction and that's something I think we can celebrate. And with a company that only has 37 million shares outstanding, and most importantly, after all this news is put to the market, we're still going to have around $5 million in cash. Mm -hmm. So this is extremely important. We raised enough capital to get us to the finish line of this preliminary economic assessment, and then we'll, we'll see where the market is. We look at it as the industry is going to be going to go through ups and downs like all commodities, but it's going to be going from the bottom left to the upper right of your screen, generally speaking, as we go through the balance of this decade. Before we wrap things up, do either of you have any final statements you want to make? I will tell the, the general public that I will be traveling again. It's since COVID and since my retirement from Copper Bank and Faraday Copper. It's a full court press to communicate the lithium bank story, but we need the document. We need the PEA. We are going to be burning shoe leather. I'm going to be attending various conferences. I've keynoted every major conference in the mining world over the past 15 years. People that have seen me there, you're going to see that again. And I, I think really drawing a parallel and comparables with the peer group. And I'm not being fantastical. I think we should trend to be valued like the peer group, depending on the, 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 the economic validity of the project. And that's what we're going to be working very hard for the balance of this year. But that starts in the fall. And look for me on agendas. I'm going to be in Zurich and Munich and various other conferences. And uh, I look forward to seeing people that I haven't seen really for three years. But um, yeah. so see, see me at a conference near you. <laughs> Absolutely. You'll be all over the world. All right, Gianni and Martin, thank you so much for joining me today. We look forward to hearing from you guys again very soon. You're welcome. Thank you.